Well, good morning by way of introduction. My name is Brian Holer. I'm the pastor. So glad that you could come out this morning and join us um, here at New Hope Community Church. We um, try to make a point of this every week and it's to acknowledge the fact that, that we're all on a journey. And, and this journey means that, that hopefully we have all come to a place where we accept Jesus Christ or if nothing else we're here just to kind of look into the claims that he makes. And so we're on this road of growing closer to him. And some of us may be maybe way over here on the road and some might be way over here, but that's what church is about. We all gather together and we, uh, we, we take this journey together. So glad you are here this morning. Uh, I want to to start because we're in this series called Connect. Uh, this is our second week. And if you weren't here last week, I want to kind of give you just a, a, a glimpse of what we did last week. Most of last week was a video that we showed. And it was uh, a video that was done by a woman named Brene Brown. And she gave a talk at uh, a TED convention. And I can never remember what TED stands for. It's like technology, entertainment, and something with a D. I don't know. Um, what it, design. design, technology, entertainment, and design. That's what it is. And uh, she gave a talk, and she is a researcher. And she gave a talk about, um, about shame and, and vulnerability. Now, she did not mention God at all in this. She didn't mention scripture. She didn't claim any affiliation with uh, what her faith was. But the first time that I saw it, uh, man, it really spoke to my heart and I thought that sounds really biblical uh, I wanted to make sure though that uh, I didn't lean upon my heart in understanding that it's biblical because Jeremiah tells us that our hearts above all else are deceitful and so uh, as it spoke to my heart I wanted to say let me, let me use Scripture as my, my plumb line, my measuring rod, and see if what she is saying has any truth. So uh, that's what I want to do today. I want to go through the talk that she gave. Now, if you weren't here last week, that's fine. Uh, hopefully, this will all be self-explanatory as we walk through it. And, and it's also on our Facebook page. If you want to look it up, there's a link to it, so you can watch it again if you'd like. But uh, So we're going to, to delve into this. And, and ask some questions about what did what she say, is it true, is, does it hold water uh, in the sight of what, what God has revealed to us. Now, again, uh, as I watched this, Jalal and I were both like, oh my gosh, this, this lines up with scripture so much, this woman must be a Christian. And, and so we beca I became very interested and we're, we're looking at anything that we can find about this woman to see if there's anything that states what her faith belief was. And we actually found a video where she states that as a researcher, she's just this hard, fast researcher. And so she mentions in her video that she had a breakdown, right? She had this, like, this, this midlife crisis kind of thing. And as a researcher, what she does, she goes and she researches, what do you do when you have a breakdown? And a lot of the research said, go to church. And so she did. She says, okay, research says it. I'm a, I'm a hard facts kind of person. So she went to church. And she said when she walked in, and you've heard me say this before, and this comes from her, she assumed that church was going to be an epidural that would take away the pain. But what she realized in the process, that church is not an epidural, it's a midwife that sits with you through the pain and tells you to push through the pain that there's, there's better stuff, there's glory on the other side of the pain. So uh, I thought that was a beautiful picture. Uh, and we did finally confirm the fact that, that she is a Christian. And, and not that uh, Christianity led her to conclusions in her research, but her research, I think, was the other way around, led her to see that the truth in Scripture. So let's pray and then we'll get started with this. Our dear Father, we give you thanks again that we have an opportunity to gather together. What freedom that we have, Lord, to be able to do that. I pray that we don't take that freedom for granted and that we uh, allow it ourselves to be, um, I guess, soft or, or uh, indifferent to the fact that we can gather and freely talk about you and freely mention the name of Jesus and freely open our Bibles. Um, Lord, I pray we become uh, 
passionate about your truth and passionate about your love. And Lord, uh, from this point on, may it be your words that speak this morning. Uh, this is holy ground. This is your area. May you have control of, of, of everything that comes from the pulpit to the pew, Lord. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Brene starts this TED. It's a convention. And the focus of the convention was, the overall arching theme was, expand perception. Which I thought, how appropriate the fact that she gets invited to this convention and it says that they're going to expand the perception of the people who attend. Because that's precisely what Jesus came to do. He came to expand the perception. When he began his public ministry, he stood up and he said that I have come with a mission to give recovery of sight for the blind. <laughs> to set the captives free. These are the things that he said. He wanted to expand our perception. And, and scripture has told us time and time again, through Jesus Christ, that's precisely what's going to happen. And, and Isaiah, it says, Behold, I will do something new. And here's, here's the thing. If we, if we read the truths of this, we, we put our faith in Christ, then there is something new, something different than what the world offers. Behold, I do something new. Uh, now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. And so, again, just even the overall... Uh, um, goal of this convention feeds right into this idea that this falls into a biblical line. <clears throat> now she makes a statement at the beginning of her talk and she says that the main purpose, the main reason uh, that human beings are hardwired for connection. This is what we thrive upon. We must have connection. This is where we find all of our worth. Uh, this is where we find the, uh, feel love if we are connected. But there's a problem in it that there's an enemy to this connection process and the enemy is shame and fear. And she states that shame and fear are, are, cause us to think and feel things like I'm not worthy or uh, I'm not lovable. It causes us to, to flee from this idea of vulnerability. We run from anything that makes us feel vulnerable. Now when we look into scripture and we see this uh, in, in Genesis, the very beginning, God created us for connection. God created Adam and Eve so that he could walk in the garden with them. And he could talk with them. He created them because he wanted to be close and have a relationship with them. The problem was that when Adam and Eve, they rebelled against God, they broke that relationship, they broke the connection they had with God. And the immediate result of that, now God's, God put it in these terms, he said, if you rebel, then, then you will die. And while there is certainly a physical death, there was an immediate connection, immediate spiritual death. They were immediately disconnected from God. And the first result of that disconnection was they looked down and they said, Whoa, we're naked. Now I'm ashamed. And now I'm scared. I hear God. I'm going to hide. In fact, in Genesis, it says, Then the eyes, as soon as they took, they rebelled against God and ate of the forbidden fruit. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked so I hid myself so we see the immediate result of disconnection was they noticed their nakedness now let's just be uh, aware of the fact that they were naked before that okay but when they had a disconnection then all of a sudden now shame comes on them because they are naked they become aware of it. And then they have this, this fear. And they want to hide themselves from God. Which, only thing that does is it creates more disconnection from God. 
she contrasts this, uh, this idea of vulnerability and she states that there are those people who don't feel this and there are, these are people who, who are called wholehearted. And this is uh, her term in the talk. She calls them wholehearted. She says these people have a strong sense of love and belonging and I actually didn't word that correctly because they do feel vulnerable but they embrace their vulnerability. And we can see that these are the attributes that God offers us when we will return in a relationship with Him. This is wholehearted. And when God calls us back to Him, He invites us and He tells us exactly this. He says, I want you to love me with all of your heart. Your whole heart. I want you to love me with your whole heart. And that would give us a, a strong sense of love and belonging. Which is precisely how she defines wholehearted. A strong sense of love and belonging. When we come back to God and we put our faith in God, we rekindle this connection, then we are creating this relationship. And God says this, this relationship is so powerful, so wonderful. He even says in John 1.12, As many as have received Him, as many as, as have received Jesus Christ, to them He gave the right to become children of God. So there's this, this reconnection that's available when we will uh, lean into we will lean into this, this vulnerability and we can accept it and, and, and draw close to him and rekindle this relationship. Now here's the thing we need to discuss a little bit more is this, this topic of vulnerability. This was the whole kind of point of the talk that she gave. And she says that vulnerability in and of itself is not bad. Here's the problem. Vulnerability creates fear in us. It creates a struggle for worthiness. It creates shame in us. But at the same time, it's also the birthplace of joy, of creativity, of belonging, of love. Which isn't real difficult to, to grasp because if you think about the closest relationships you have in this world, what are the people that you are most vulnerable with? Again, when Adam and Eve sinned, we, knew, we know that they were already naked. They were already vulnerable. But when they sinned, they became ashamed and scared. And, and, they, and they tried to cover it up. So they go around and they collect some leaves and they say, oh, well, this... <laughs> and, and... And, um... That really didn't work the way I wanted it to, but... But they tried to cover it up, this, this what they're noticing now about themselves. So it's not something different. It's not so, that something that had changed necessarily in them physically, but they noticed it and they are ashamed of it and they want to cover it up. And you and I, we do that every day. We try to hide the things about ourselves that, that we, all of a sudden, we're, we're so focused on, so super sensitive to. We think that they're bad things and we become arrogant because of that. We think, oh, if I, if I show arrogance, then it will cover up the fact that there are things that I'm weak at and I'm not good at. We show uh, anger, and, and if somebody maybe even gets close to this area where we feel vulnerable, then we lash out in anger. Uh, we get attitude with people. We get a, a, a multitude of things that we do to deal with the vulnerability that we feel. But here's what God did in this situation. He entered into the picture. And, and where Adam and Eve are, are trying to, to cover themselves up with, with these inadequate leaves, then God says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a vulnerable, innocent lamb, and I myself, I'm going to lead it to slaughter. So God takes, a, a, this is right in Genesis 3, God takes a lamb and he leads it to slaughter, and he takes the hide of the lamb, and he uses it for the covering of Adam and Eve. Makes them clothes to cover their nakedness. So in order for Adam and Eve to overcome the shame and the fear that they had, they had to embrace the vulnerability of, 
of this lamb, they had to accept the covering, the lamb's covering, as their own. Right off the bat, Genesis 3, beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. Beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus is that lamb. Jesus is the one who is the only one who's sufficient enough to cover our shame. This doesn't do it. Anger doesn't do it. Attitude doesn't do it. Arrogance doesn't do it. None of the things that we try to cover our shame with are adequate. Jesus Christ is the only thing that's adequate and He is the Lamb that came and in and of Himself, in and of Himself, He came off of a throne. The King of Kings came off of the throne and said, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to be vulnerable to an angry mob. I'm going to be vulnerable to, to an, an, an arrogant Roman governor. I'm going to be vulnerable to the tree that I planted. To the nails that, that I embedded in the earth. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to make myself vulnerable to that. And Jesus is the lamb that is slain to cover our sins. We don't like vulnerability. The reality is we are vulnerable. Whether we want to admit it or not. And in fact, uh, and as she points out that, that the more that we don't want to admit it, then, then the more we use shame and, and, and fear to cover it up. Paul says it. Paul says that, uh, yeah, I'm weak. I'm vulnerable. And you know what? I, I praise God about it because it's in my weakness. That's where God shows up. It's in my vulnerability is when God shows up and the power of Christ comes out. And Brene in her talk, she talks about what is our response to this. How do we deal with vulnerability? Uh, how does the world deal with vulnerability? Well, she points out that we are living in a time in history when we uh, are, our society is more in debt, more obese, more addicted, more medicated than ever in history. And these are just some of the ways that we deal with th this vulnerability that we feel with. Either we're going to uh, uh, numb it uh, through buying stuff, or we're going, we're going to uh, uh, numb it by, by enjoying uh, physical pleasures of food or, or drugs or alcohol, or we're going to, to numb it by, by medicating it away. There's a void there's a hole in us that only God can fill and we will it's a, it's a, when we try to fill it with anything else it's a bottomless pit we can pour uh, food and money and stuff and, and, and substances and everything into this void and it will never ever be filled it's the leaves that we try to cover ourselves with Here's what we do. We, we attempt to. We say, okay, I'm going to, uh, this vulnerability thing, it's, it's not comfortable. It, it, and I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to kind of numb myself to that. I'm going to say that I'm not going to experience that. I'm going to numb myself to it. And so uh, what we try to do is we try to say um, all the, the negative stuff, all the bad stuff that comes at me, I'm just going to kind of shut everything off. I'm going to turn off all my emotions. I'm going to just allow it to kind of hit me and, and, and roll right past me and I'm not going to feel it. But the problem is with that is, is we can't selectively do that. We've got one part in us that we turn on and off for emotions and vulnerability. And when we shut it off for one thing, we shut it off to everything. We shut it off to pain, then that means we're shutting it off to joy. We shut it off to things that, that, that hurt us, that means we're shutting it off to things that enliven us and fill us up. So we get to a place in history where Jesus talks about in Matthew 24 and he says, you know, as the end comes near, uh, love is going to grow cold. 
love is going to grow cold because of lawlessness and because people don't want to feel they don't want to feel the pain that's going on around them. They don't want to feel their own pain. They don't want to feel things. And so love is just going to die out with it. And we go and we do things this week. We want to make uh, the things that are uncertain, certain. We want to fight about things that are uh, maybe gray areas or non-issues and allow them to be points of, of contention and disconnection as opposed to uh, allowing some leeway. And that's a, that's a slippery slope in an entire another series. But this is one of the things that we do. There are things that we need to hold on to and lean into as truth, but many of the ones that we take a stand on, they don't fall into that category. Ephesians, uh, and the whole scripture repeatedly calls us to humility. We blame people. She states the definition, that the, the clinical definition of blame is to discharge pain and discomfort. And so we will, we will discharge pain and discomfort on other people. We will blame them for things and we will put it on other people uh, because it stems from shame and fear, not because it stems from truth and love. perfect. We attempt to earn God's favor through uh, earning it. We're, we're going to do it through works. I, I deserve heaven. And we'll perfect things around us. Your house has to be perfect before anybody will step into it. And so when's the last time you had a person to your house? Your kids have to be perfect. They got to do all the right things, and if they don't get the A, then then you know they're in trouble. And you know, we 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 want everything to be perfect, and we pretend. We pretend to be people who we're not. Uh, we pretend to be uh, good at things that we're not. We pretend, and we become the whitewashed tombs, the hypocrites. We put a foot forward that isn't our foot. Because we're scared that if people see who we really are, then they're, they're not going to like what they see. And here's the glorious part of this, because she says that there's another way. There's another way. There's a different way, because the response that, that we just went over, that's the response of the world. That's how the world responds to sin and shame and fear. That's how the world responds, but there is a different way. It is available. And, and it's a narrow way. Not a whole lot of people take it. it it's, a, it's, a, it's an untried way for, for many. It's different. Her words, she says, be seen. You know, in Scripture that says, allow God to, to, to look into us. Search me, O God. Know my heart. See me for who I am. Help me to see me for who I am. Help me to stop living a lie. She says, love with your whole heart. We know that the Bible, and God says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your might. And then love your neighbor the same way. Love with your whole heart. Open that up. And that's scary, and it's dangerous, and you're going to get hurt. I'll go ahead and put that right out front and tell you that. Okay? I'm, I'm not trying to uh, paint a, a pretty picture with, uh, you know, magical little unicorns. Because if you embrace this, you set yourself up to get hurt. And you will. But the rewards that come out of this are immense. And far outweigh the pain. She says, practice gratitude and joy. And we know that scripture tells us that God has created us for good works. And our, our good works are not to earn anything from God. Our good works are not to, to go and say, look God, I've done all this great stuff. Now you have to open up the doors to your kingdom and so I can come in. Our good works are to say, I see what you've done. 
for me. And I'm, I'm so grateful and I'm so filled with joy that I'm going to go out and I'm going to live a life that shows that. I'm going to live a life of gratitude. I'm going to live a life of joy as a result of what you've done. And she closes with this. She says, Believe you're worthy. In a secular sense, there's a, a problem with this. And in a secular sense, we get really caught up in this. And, and we get really hung up on this and we have a hard time with it because the world tells you, you you're not worthy. So you've got to pretend. You've got to cover up. You've you got to put a different foot forward. You, you've got to numb. The mystery is God says you're worthy. And, 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 and yet you're not. But, but here's the weird thing about it because he says, you know what? Um, I love you so much I'm going to send my son. And I'm going to let my son die for you. That's how worthy you are. He says, I'm going to give my son for you. Now we can talk about uh, you know, uh, the Calvinistic point of view, which has, is true in the fact that we're not worthy, but he did it for us anyway. But in God's eyes, he says, you're worthy, and I, and I died for you. Now here's the thing, you have to believe this. You have to believe this. And I'm not saying that you need to believe that Jesus Christ uh, that it was a person. That's not the belief I'm talking about. I'm not saying you need to even believe that Jesus was, was the God-man, which he was. But even if you believe that, that's not enough. I'm not even saying that you have to believe that Jesus Christ came to earth to die on a cross for sins. You can believe that and it's not enough. What I'm saying is you have to believe that Jesus Christ is a God-man, left his throne, came to earth, died on a cross for you. You have to believe you were worthy for him to die on that cross. Because he did. And if you think everybody else around you is worthy, but, but it's not for you, then that's not believing and the salvation, the price that he paid for you. He calls us to reap the rewards of vulnerability. The lamb that was slain, that made himself vulnerable to death. And you have to believe that you are worthy of what he's done. I think this whole thing is amazing because you know we can look and, and so many times we have this, this idea that science is pitted against faith and that's such a load of garbage because science time and time and time again bolsters faith archaeology bolsters faith astrology not astrology, astronomy bolsters faith. Astrology is garbage. Astronomy bolsters faith. Physics bolsters faith. Philosophy it bolsters faith. Here we're, we're talking about psychology. A, a researcher who goes into this with no idea, no thought about what God is or what he has to say or anything and she researches this for 10 years and says, here's what I found. Vulnerability. When we respond to it in fear and shame it does bad stuff. If we embrace it, there's glory from that. Could have saved you some time with your research. It says exactly what Scripture tells us. It confirms what Scripture tells us. You know, Brene Brown, she worded it. She worded it well in such a way that it touched our hearts, but it it was her words that were spoke, but it's the story of the fallen man, of Jesus, uh, uh, fallen man and the redemption in Jesus Christ that touched our hearts.
She worded it, but it's not her story. It's his story. So the challenge is for us to embrace our vulnerability, to lean into that, to lean into the fact that we are vulnerable, that we are weak. And that if we lean into that, there's so much beauty that can come out of it. So much joy that can come out of that if we will connect with the people around us. And you can't connect without vulnerability. You have to lean into that. And understanding that the basis of that, the foundation of that, like Paul says, if I lean into my weakness, then Christ is the strength that shows forth. Then He is that vulnerable. He showed the way. He follow me. He says, follow me. Be vulnerable. Make connections. That's what he calls us to. To experience the joy that he has for us. The abundant life that he has for us. So as we close, here's my challenge to you today. I checked. There's no Bengals game, so you can't use that as an excuse. (laughs) Find somebody that you don't know in this room invite them to lunch. Find somebody that, that, that maybe you recognize the face but you don't know their name and say, hey, would you join me for lunch? My name is... And go down the street because and, and, you know you're going to go to lunch anyway. And, and for us to just, you know, drop a bomb in here and everybody scatter on their own doesn't make sense. Connect. Be vulnerable. Let me tell you, I, I may be one of the biggest introverts in here. But even as an introvert, you need to lean into that idea. Make connections. It's what God's created us for. So there's my challenge. Invite somebody to lunch. Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to... Um, learn from you. Always. Always want to learn from you, Lord. Lord, we see that this whole uh, message here just is another confirmation that that you are the one who has come and died for our sins and that we need to accept you personally. And not not the idea of you, uh, not the the, the church-wide view of you, but personally we need to accept you, Lord. And so I pray that A, that we do that. That needs to be the foundation of everything that we do. And then B, that we follow you into that place of vulnerability and seek connections because that is the entire purpose of, of embracing that. That's the entire purpose of our being is to connect with one another. And Lord, we can accomplish so many things through connection. We are one body. Help us to begin to, uh, to melt together into that one body. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word, for your truth. And Lord, we ask for your strength as we, we step out into this challenge. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.